and welcome back to Witch Fix. I'm talking today about how to hang a witch, which is not an instructional guide. It's a novel by Adriana Mather. Now, I don't know how much everyone knows about Salem and the witch trials of Salem, but Mather is a name that should pop for you if you know a little bit about it, or even if you've seen the terrible TV series called Salem, because Cotton Mather was one of the men who was responsible for a lot of stuff going on in the witch trials. He wrote books about catching witches and various other things. And Adriana Mather is actually a descendant of Cotton Mather. She is the one of the 12th generation of mothers in America. She's also an actress, but this is, I think, her first novel. The book that I'm going to be talking about today came out in 2016. So I'm a little bit late on this one, but still pretty current I have to say. It's a young adult novel. It's slightly different to other novels that I've looked at in that the protagonist is not on the surface of things a witch. A lot of times when Salem is mentioned the main character will be a descendant of one of the accused witches but the main character is called Samantha Mather and she is like the author a direct descendant of Cotton Mather. The book starts with Sam and her stepmother Vivian returning to Salem. Sam herself has actually never visited Salem but her father was born and raised there by her grandmother who has since died. They move back into her grandmother's house because her father has recently had a sort of stroke and has gone into a coma and they need the money from the sale of their New York apartment to pay for his medical bills. So that's been sold and she and her stepmother have moved into this house in Salem. Salem, obviously not a great place to be if your surname is Mather. And so Sam quickly discovers when she enrolls at the local high school. There's a group of kind of gothically dressed girls who instantly put me in mind of the Cullens in the Twilight novels who wear black, hang out only with each other and are referred to with awe and fear by the rest of the populace of the high school as the descendants and as the name implies they are direct descendants of the women who were executed for witchcraft. They obviously don't have a great relationship with Samantha Mather at the start in fact they're kind of horrible to her and they instantly start vaguely threatening behavior towards her and then some actually quite explicit threatening behavior towards her because they don't like her and they want her to go away a lot of bad things start happening straight after sam gets to salem people start dying people start getting injured and this is all blamed on her the descendants at the high school start a sort of campaign against her and she finds herself getting less and less popular by the day. The only friend she actually has in the town is her next door neighbour, whose name is Jackson. And he is the son of her father's childhood friend, who is sort of a, a lovely little old lady now who owns a bakery. And she was also a friend of the grandmother herself. So they're the only people who are nice to Sam in the whole town of Salem. Her stepmother is a little bit of an odd fish. They have quite a good relationship according to Sam's narration, but they have kind of a, a cold and distant relationship. Her stepmom kind of seems like the kind of person who would carry a blackberry around with her all the time and wear really high heels and talk a lot about furnishings, decor and business. She's not really one for emotion, but she is very firmly in the Sam camp as we see at the start of the novel. She kind of phones people, she puts bullies in their place and she yells at the principal when he tries to discipline Sam for someone writing horrible things on her locker. As the events of the book unfold, you start to delve into a little bit more of the law surrounding the Mathers and the Salem descendants. And that law is obviously fictional in terms of the book. But the idea is that once there is someone from every family affected by the witch trials in Salem, so the, the Mathers and all the descendants, then bad things start happening. People in those families start to die. And Sam coming back to Salem means that there is now a member of every family there. So it's sort of creating this nexus of destruction and curseness. Complicating matters is the fact that Sam's house is haunted and it's haunted by a ghost called Elijah. Uh, he is a guy who lived around about the time of Salem and he 
his story comes out as you go into the novel and he becomes a sort of friend slash love interest for Samantha as the book continues. It's quite interesting actually. I didn't find myself enjoying the first couple of chapters. There's a few bits in it that kind of feel oddly worded and a bit awkward and I'll read you a little bit of that in a moment. But they, they come across some of the speeches a little bit stilted and the appearance of these kind of group of only black wearing mean girls kind of made me roll my eyes just a little bit. Um, likewise, the increased pace towards the ending of the book made it kind of clumsy and a little bit um, hard to follow. A lot of exposition comes out in this sort of frenetic fight sequence at the end, which makes it a little bit hard to follow. And after a midsection, which kind of felt a little flabby and overwritten, it kind of meant that I had to re-engage my focus and try and get with what was happening in a very quick way. So I found the pacing a little odd. And there's a mystery throughout the book. Essentially, her grandmother, when she was alive, had nightmares about someone who she called the Crow Woman. And the idea that this woman lived in a house in the woods or by herself and is perhaps the source of this strange curse that's affecting all the descendant families. Spoiler alert. The Crow Woman is revealed to be Elijah's fiance, who kind of went crazy and went off to live in the woods and eat birds, which obviously that's what you did in the days before Netflix. And then we're sort of left wondering who this woman is, except it's quite obvious because her name is Anne and the stepmother's name is Vivianne. And it's always the stepmother. No matter how good a relationship they try and tell you in the book, no matter how well they get on, it's always the stepmother. So I found that ridiculously predictable. But it was quite fun getting there. The book itself was a very quick read and I literally couldn't put it down, which is what it says on the cover as a review. So I concur. It is quite compulsive reading. You get into it, there are short chapters, which keeps you turning the page and going on and on to the next one. And you kind of end up rooting for Samantha because she's just enough hard ass to make you think, oh, OK, so you're not just going to take this. You're going to fight back. But without being kind of cold and calculating. I also found it interesting how she ends up befriending members of the descendants and getting involved in witchcraft. So that's kind of an interesting slant on it. And obviously the fact that it's based in the author's own experiences. She says that she um, went to visit Salem and was signing the guest registry at a hotel when she was told, ah, Mather, that's not a, uh, a popular name around here. And that's what got her thinking about it, which I think is quite interesting. I think this one is quite a nice self-contained novel to read if you're interested in a book that's sort of about witchcraft, but also has um, some new law in it, as opposed to the usual kind of based in Wicca law, which is quite popular in teen fiction. It's also quite funny. There are some amusing moments in it, particularly with Elijah, this sort of centuries old ghost. And yeah, I found it in general quite amusing and quite nice to read. In terms of some of the stuff that's a little bit phrased oddly, and this is a section from the beginning of the book, page 13, uh, Jackson has shown Sam into the house and up to her room because his mum has sort of been doing it up for them before they arrive. The following takes place and it's kind of like one of those, oh my god, it's so awkward teen fiction moments, but just the things that happen are just very odd and not things that you would necessarily think of as one of the standard awkward things that could happen. It just, it just felt a little bit weird and clunky to me. I run my hand along the ivory lace bedspread and down comforter. My black duffel bag looks so unsophisticated in comparison with these antiques balanced on sloping wooden floors. I'm sure what to say next. I pull my lip gloss from my pocket and pop off the cap. This is the longest conversation I've had with someone my own age in years. Jackson lifts my bag off his shoulder. Where do you want this? I'll take it. I reach out to grab the strap, but I misjudge his movement and instead of smoothly lifting the bag out of his grip as I intended, I smear my open lip gloss on his hand. He stops and smiles. Pink's not really my colour. Sorry, I say quickly. I don't usually attack people with my lip gloss. As though some people use lip gloss as a weapon? What am I even saying right now? 
All I can think to do is wipe it off with my hand, which I do awkwardly. More of a swat than a wipe, really. His grin widens. He puts my duffel bag down and grabs a tissue from my vanity. Jackson lifts my hand with the strawberry-flavoured smear on it. He turns my palm up and lightly runs the tissue over it. My heart gallops. I don't even like blondes. It's not going to break, I say. My hand, I mean, it's, it's not going to break. Well, I'd rather not take my chances. His confidence is starting to frustrate me. He's hogging it all and should really leave some for the rest of the planet. He looks from my hands to my face. Who knows what you'll attack me with next? I take my hand back. What? Oh yeah, I mean, no, I mean, I won't touch you. Ugh, shit, really? He nods, barely containing a laugh. So, see you in school tomorrow. So you can kind of see that that's just, it's very odd. I mean, if you're going to think of something embarrassing happening, it's not really accidentally swiping someone with a lip gloss that you're for some reason holding open in your hand. The whole way that it's written it just kind of made me a little bit like, this is just strange and I had to reread that scene quite a few I think like three times just to kind of work out what the big deal was and what was happening and why it was happening and why she felt the way she did it was just very confusing thankfully those things sort of stop happening about three or four chapters in which is only about 20 pages because as I said the chapters are quite short uh, and for the most part the book is then written in a way that's just very easy to read very teen fiction and as I said, those those weird kind of what the fuck moments just stop happening and the rest reads like a normal book. How to Hang a Witch by Adriana Mather. It's published by Walker Books and you can buy it on Amazon. And um, you probably still buy it in bookshops as well, because as I said, it only came out in 2016. Uh, so it's still quite current and modern. So definitely give that one a look if you're looking for new teen fiction involving witchcraft or witches with a slightly fresher take on the mythology. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. As usual you can contact me on Twitter at witchfix or by email which is witchfixpodcast at gmail.com. You can also donate to my Patreon and you'll find links every which way for that and I hope you enjoy this episode and I'll see you next time. Bye!